Another Bendigo Writers Festival backstory, and we're welcoming this week a wonderful Louise Milligan. Not that I'm partisan, but I've read her books and they're fantastic. And we're very grateful for Louise for joining us because she's been a very busy person. Um, apologies in advance, the sound will be great. The, uh, the vision might be a tiny bit of lag, but it's well worth having a listen to Louise Milligan. So we're pleased that to have her here today. Um, Louise, there's been a steady stream of high profile sexual assault cases that are reported in headlines and snippets and stories in the media. And there's one in the courts right now, which is playing out. So do you think that you could have written um, witness without your own experience of being questioned by an adversarial defence barrister? I think I could have written it because there are many examples, you know, of this, but I don't think that I would have had such a profound understanding of what it was like because um, I have to say that my experience was <laughs> nothing short of politicising, to be honest, um, because it was so traumatic. Um, it was so... I, I, I just couldn't believe that people could be treated in that way. And, you know, I don't want it to be like the lady that doth protest too much, you know, that, that you know, I, I, I do accept that I am incredibly privileged compared to many of the people who come before the courts as complainant witnesses. Um, but that's kind of the point because I'm in a much better position than they are because I was being advised by um, an amazing QC and I had the ABC behind me and all of the things that you might um, hope for. And I've got a law degree and I've been watching this stuff go on for years. Um, I was very well prepared and I'm not dealing with a very, you know, profound personal trauma, which is a crime, a sexual crime committed against me. And yet it was just so awful um, in the sense of it was just so, I was just not treated with any dignity or respect, you know, the whole way through the tone was belittling. I would say, in my opinion, from what I could see harassing, there's a pr provision in the Evidence Act which bans improper questioning. Now that goes to tone as well as substance. I failed to see almost any part of that day where the tone wasn't inappropriate in terms of how he was addressing me. Um, so the thing that I found really fascinating though was when, you know, two years or oh, a year and a half down the track, whatever it was, I went to listen to the audio of the cross-examination of young Paris Street, who was the victim in the St. Kevin's case that I covered for Four Corners, a, a victim of grooming by his athletics coach. Now, Paris was cross-examined by the same person as me, Robert Richter QC, when he was 15 years old. And it was just jaw-dropping to listen to that cross-examination because it was exactly the same tone employed for Paris as it was for me. And this is a child, you know, um, and Paris had no preparation for that. I mean, the, the Crown Prosecutor, you know, came and showed him that some sort of diorama of this is where everyone sits in the court. And there was someone there to hold the tissues and, you know, say, there, there, Paris, if he got upset but no one to actually prepare him for the mechanics of the courtroom situation and how to handle this absolute onslaught. And, you know, for someone like Paris, it was so uh, undermining. He was a kid from a pretty privileged background who was coming forward thinking that he was doing his sort of duty as a citizen by making this complaint about a groomer. He hadn't been physically abused, but he was concerned that others might. And so he came to the court to, to give his evidence, ha having no idea that he was going to be absolutely torn apart in the witness box. And, you know, he, he, he tells me about it in the book. Um, he, came out of the remote witness facility and he just sobbed. 
And it was like his kind of world came crashing down that day. And to this day, he is still recovering from the trauma of that experience. And probably won't recover, actually. Your book, you call it a, an investigation into what happens when people who want justice, like Paris Street, are met with a, quote, paternalistic, disappointing and bruising system. Now, paternalistic, part of the history of the of law, really, as we know, it's a system that's built on masculinist hierarchies of power. But what about disappointing, which is what you describe Paris Street? Do we collectively, do you think, expect quality and decency from the law? I don't see why we shouldn't. I don't see why we shouldn't expect when a person comes forward to complain of a dreadful thing that's happened to them. Um, often, you know, with historical uh, sexual abuse cases, they've held on to this terrible secret for 20, 30, 40 years. They finally plucked up the courage, that child in them that said, you won't be believed, you won't be treated with dignity and respect, you will be castigated in the same way that your perpetrator did. That's exactly what we do to them when they come before the courts. And really, uh, my view is, and I have seen it done, and I have read transcripts where it's been done, there is more than one way to skin a cat. You can achieve a forensic purpose as a defence counsel without treating someone with um, you know, disrespect and without being rude and bullying. Uh, and you know, you when when I spoke to defence counsel for this book, as I did to many, they are of the view that you know all of that is in the past. The table thumpers are gone. They tell me, but when you speak to victims, that's not what they say. And when you look at the transcripts, that's clearly not what's happening. I think there's a bit of a disconnect between what the defence counsel think they're doing and what they're actually doing. And I think they get into a space, a zone, when they're in court and they go to the tried and true mechanisms that they've always gone to, the bottom drawer of reasonable doubts, the, you know, the, the, the harassing and bullying tone. And I'm not saying every single one of them, but some of them and certainly some high profile ones. Um, and they just hurt people. And, you know, consistently what has been said, not just to me, but to law reform commissions, to the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse, uh, to psychologists who I interviewed for this book, um, is that the cross-examination was as bad or if not worse than the original crime. One of the things you do say towards the end, or at the end, is that they're actually not that successful anymore because they do it at committal hearings because they know that a jury's going to maybe think, "Oi, you can't, you can't berate someone like that." So they they get it all out to try to to upset the witness at the committal hearing. Well, I think they often reserve their worst behaviour for the committal hearing um, because, that yeah, they're, they're just trying to, by hook or by crook, do whatever they can to throw the whole thing out. Um, and they're not so worried about what the magistrate thinks or, or, or does. They, they know that the magistrate, you know, has to sort of like look at the law. Um, having said that, in a promising development, um, the Victorian uh, Law Reform Commission has now recommended getting rid of committal proceedings in these cases. And I think that's a really welcome development because um, I, I remember myself, you know, I gave evidence in the committal hearing in the Pell case. And after it was over, I was just absolutely exhausted. It took me really weeks to feel normal again, I must say. And then I had this dread, you know, at the back of my mind because there, at that stage there were going to be two trials and I was to give evidence at both of them. And I knew that this was all ahead of me once again, you know, even if some of the techniques employed were modified for the jury. Actually, in one case that I, um, where I spoke to the victim, it was an Airbnb rape for the book. Um, she had a worse time at trial than she did in the committal. So it, it doesn't always sort of go that way. But the fact that people had to go through it twice, I think is really unfair. And I think 
you know, it's something which other jurisdictions around the country should have a look at following this lead that Victoria, well, certainly the Victorian Law Reform Commission has uh, recommended. As you're talking, I'm, I'm remembering so much about this book, which is a, it, it's a, it's a page turner, really. But I'm not, I'm very grateful to you to be having the ability to do it. But it's also, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge, as many people have reviews have said, it's challenging. But journalism and books about sex crimes deal with the difficulty of providing, you have to deal with the difficulty of providing detail on stuff, enough detail to readers. and Possibly readers are desensitised by screen violence and even in books, violence and, and, uh, and titillation in, in books and videos. You prefer a couple of times to actually leave out some of the details if you can. Do you think that it's, it goes back to something you just said before about going to magistrates too. Do you think the courts themselves are desensitised by hearing about these crimes? I think to a certain extent, yes. Um, and sometimes that's borne out in the sorts of advice that is given to me to give to the victims. You know, they say things like, oh, you know, please tell witness Jay that, you know, he did a really good job. He tried really hard, you know, and that beyond reasonable doubt is a terribly high bar and, you know, well done to him sort of thing. And it's like, well, that's not really very much... Um, <laughs> Uh, sucker for someone who has gone through a five-year ordeal to try and bring a very high-profile person to what he believes is justice. Um, and also with defence counsel, what I routinely found, and with prosecutors as well, they talk about how they don't really manage their own trauma, that they deal with it a lot of the time by drinking. I mean, that was, that was a common thing that they told me. They were very candid about that. And in fact, they talked about one high profile barrister who they said, uh, it was volunteered to me um, repeatedly, drinks half a bottle of scotch a day. And he doesn't just do it after the, the, the cross-examination. He, he starts drinking before, according to these people, to get into the place. So, you know, I think there's a lot of unmet trauma in them because it's like they're all sort of like keeping up this bravado and they work for themselves. Um, and it's like the idea that, oh, well, you know, so-and-so's lost his or her marbles, you know, and they'll lose their practice. That's what they're worried about. Um, and I think that when they don't deal with their own trauma, uh, that leads to not being able to properly empathise with the people that they're cross-examining, that trauma. Um, and, you know, they have this idea that there are all these um, false complainants running around, you know, um, and that's not supported by worldwide research. Um, it shows that the number of false complaints is low and made up primarily by people who are floridly mentally ill or are um, in family court disputes where it's parent versus parent. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a myth, but they're all searching for that false complaint, you know? I mean, there was one barrister who talked to me about, you know, an example where, I, I can't remember all the details, but it was like, you know, this stepfather was beating the bejesus out of these two girls, uh, but there were ho holes in, one of the girls accounts of being raped so you know it was obvious that that wasn't true uh but he accepted that the stepfather was beating the hell out of them <laughs> that's your example <laughs> that's the thing that you're reaching for i mean seriously mm -hmm. um and you know mm -hmm. others would sort of talk about oh there was this person who you know told a story all the way along and then dropped out and said she made it all up and you know, people drop out for all sorts of reasons, primarily because the system is just so ho horrendous. Um, mm. And I'm not saying that false complaints never happen, but they are extraordinarily rare. And I'm also not saying that we shouldn't subject all complaints to robust scrutiny, because the mm. presumption of innocence is vital mm. to the system of justice that we have. It mm. shouldn't be eroded. Um, 
beyond reasonable doubt is, you know, an important aspect of the, of the system. But none of that means that people should be bullied. They don't need to be. You can, you can find inconsistencies in evidence without speaking to someone like they are lesser than you. Mm -hmm. Or going and, you know, politicising it as well. The barristers in particular are, um, it's, it's a fascinating um, portrait of, of these people. And I confess to not really understanding so much about the law. You know, you explain very beautifully and simply, you know, what a silk is. And they love this arcane language and it seems to structure their institutions. I think it's important that readers understand that this is not um, just a book about the case of Saxon Mullins, George Pell um, and Paris Street, or at least, it, it, you know, it's not just about that. It's about the standards we agree to and therefore live by. Um, early on in, in um, Witness, you write about um, the naming of the Peter O'Callaghan Gallery in the mm. Owen Dixon Chambers, very prestigious chambers, the original home of Victorian Bar. Tell us why you included that. I was gobsmacked when I found out about the Peter O'Callaghan Gallery. Um, so, it is a gallery that is in, in the foyer of Owen Dixon Chambers, which is the home of the Victorian Bar, as you say. It's full of all these portraits of, you know, judges and barristers and like an awful lot of men, let's face it, like old white guys. It's, it's, and a lot of female barristers have said to me, you know, they hate walking through there and prosecutors hate walking through there. Um, there are very few women and they stand out so vividly because they women tend to wear color so they're like these sort of like little beacons you know scattered here and there and they've had to space them out because there are so few of them but um i was talking to matt collins who is who was the president of the um victorian bar who is a fabulous guy and you know um he is a pretty progressive sort of person and and proud of trying to make the bar more reflective of the real community so more women more people of color blah 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 blah. anyway he was sort of saying how he'd organized this uh exhibition in the peter o'callaghan gallery of you know diversity blah 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 and i was like hang on what the what the who <laughs> because i knew all about peter Peter O'Callaghan, um, and I, some people call him O'Callaghan. Anyway, I'm, I'll, I'll stick with O'Callaghan for now. But because in the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse and also the Victorian Parliamentary Inquiries Betrayal of Trust report, he was something of a star of the show for not particularly positive reasons because he ran. Um, the Melbourne response, George Pell's Melbourne response, a special commissioner. And anyway, the bottom line is the Royal Commission found that Peter, Peter O'Callaghan discouraged victims from going to the police in a system where, for instance, you were about, you were bound to get about $25,000 in compensation for your lifetime of pain he meanwhile made millions out of this scheme over a couple of decades um and you know when i spoke to chrissy foster who who is the mother of two girls who were abused by a catholic priest um one tragically died the other one is permanently disabled after she walked into traffic she was just like gasping that these men would name a gallery after a person like that. Now, I'm not saying that Peter O'Callaghan was an unreconstructed villain that only did bad things in his life. That's not true. But of all the people in the Victorian bar's long and proud history, like we're talking people like Robert Menzies and Owen Dixon and, you know, lots of very, very accomplished people premiers etc they chose this guy and not only that they chose to name the gallery after him just a couple of months after the melbourne response case study went through the royal commission and we the australian public heard about what this man had done to survivors 
I just have no words for how <sighs> lacking in empathy for people's pain that decision is. And I just don't understand how they can continue to defend it. And, and the defence was, oh, well, it was the cab rank principle. So barristers have a thing called the cab rank principle, which is that they just take the next case that comes along, right? Well, I can tell you right now that that's not true because I've spoken to barristers who just find something you know, some reason why they can't do a particular case mm. because they object to it. Oh, I'm terribly busy. You know, I'll be doing something else at that time because they don't want to get involved with things. It's nonsense to say that barristers always adhere to the cab rank principle. But secondly, Peter O'Callaghan was working on the Melbourne response as its special commissioner for the better part of 20 years. And, and so it's not like it's, as I say in the book, it's not like it's just a cab driver picking up a passenger it's like the cab driver picks up the passenger drives him around for 20 years tells him where to go and and runs his life for him you know what i mean it's completely different and it i just find it really really emblematic of the type of institution that the bar is and let's go to the stats this is an institution that is made up in victoria of uh, 70 percent men 30 percent women there are more men aged over 50 than there are women full stop um, tiny number of silks it's even worse in New South Wales only 23 percent of New South Wales barristers are women and twice as many aged men over 50 than women so you cannot sort of imagine a more patriarchal institution and i think when you have an institution like that these are the sorts of decisions that are made and these are the sorts of people that women children and men who are broken bringing historical claims come before you know um it, it's <sighs> and i'm not saying that all older men are like this because you know some of them are absolutely wonderful i know some older male white barristers who are just beautiful people and who are incredibly empathetic um and you know who are really trying to to bring about change but the stats just don't lie you know um we need more change Indeed, and it's the, 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 when you talk about not being able to have empathy, it goes back to that question I was saying about being desensitised and also the amount of money that flows through an organisation or an institution and, and a, um, a, a business like this, uh, you know, an institution in our, in our society. You, one of the, um, the, the chapters that, about Paris Street, which is astonishing stuff, um, but really it's not just the court case, it's what happens afterwards. That's the boy to remind people from St Kevin's who was groomed by a sports teacher, um, towards trainer. And you write, it's a pattern that victims of sexual crimes repeatedly see the inability of people to see that their colleague, their friend, their employee, their ally, could be a perpetrator. Why do you think that happens, Louise? I think it's really, really difficult for people to think that their friend could be a perpetrator of child sexual crimes or any sexual crimes. You know, you think you know someone and they do something like this, but the bottom line is that these people do not advertise their crimes and they groom not just children or women in the case of adult sex offenders they groom a whole community uh, they groom politicians they groom members of the legal fraternity they groom business leaders they they groom church officials they groom worshippers in congregations they groom parents at scout halls, you know, that's what they do. They're really, really good at that. They're very, very convincing at that. And so it's, it's it, it, you know, when these people come forward to be um, prosecuted in a court of law, routinely, and I talk about this in the book, 
a whole lot of people line up to give them character references. And imagine how incredibly distressing that is for the person who is courageous enough to make um, the allegation against them of a sexual crime. It, it, it is so, so upsetting for, for those people to see pillars of the community come forward. Prime ministers, for instance, just, you know, as an example, to come mm. forward and do that. I've got, a, I've got a feeling, Louise, that there's two things happening. Um, one is that we used to think um, sexual misconduct was, uh, was, was less important than we do now. I mean, the number of, in your book and, and other books that have been written about um, the Ballarat um, Church, I think we've realised the number of people that, it's, that it hasn't just, oh, it was bad luck, wasn't it? That was bad, but move on. I think we're now understanding how deeply people's lives, and you, you talk about this a lot in, in, in the book, and there's that thing about also you write about um, people saying, oh, was it called it a misdemeanor? I mean, it's happening now um, with your next <laughs> work that you're doing. Oh, it's a misdemeanor. Oh, I'm sorry, I've moved on. And then, no, wait a minute, you haven't actually understood what you're saying. And um, this is not really a question. I'm thinking about it as, as you go. And you must be thinking to yourself, when is this ever going to go deeply into our community that we understand the damage that is done and we care about that damage? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the caring about the damage for me. Um, I see these people um, who can't get out of bed in the morning. I see these people who can't hold down a full-time job. I see these people who can do those things, but every single day of their lives, um, and I talked about this in my first book, Cardinal, there's like this super eight rickety film playing in their mind of what happened to them. Um, and the disbelief that they encounter the sort of prima facie disbelief before anything else. Oh, this couldn't be true. Hmm. Why? It, of course it could be true. We've just had a five year Royal Commission outline in scarifying detail why it is true and why it could be true. Um, yeah, it's, I, I, I do find it very, very disappointing that we still struggle as a society to come to terms with this um, and that oh, people allow culture wars and politics and political allegiances, religious affiliations, um, you know, those sorts of things to get in the way of caring about people who have been profoundly hurt. I want to stick to witness, um, Louise, but it's but as you talk, I'm I'm hearing people say about the latest accusations of the Canberra bubble and um, the use of sexual power relations, and and people mm. saying that that it was consensual, um, but but no, it's no problem. Um, do you, I mean you must be <laughs> you must be thinking about this? What do you say to people who? think that a relationship between a young or a, a woman and a man in power, for example, is consensual? Um, it may well be consensual at the beginning. Um, it, you know, I mean, but it becomes very difficult to get out of. And Sarah Hanson Young spoke about that in our Four Corners story on um, last Monday night she spoke about a conversation with a young woman who had, she said, got into a relationship with um, Christian Porter, the attorney general, first law officer of the nation, and who found that she couldn't get out of this relationship. And, you know, um, these men and their supporters will say, oh, well, you know, um, these are just allegations. Oh, this person's not come forward and whatever. No wonder. No wonder, look at what has happened to Rochelle Miller, the uh, woman who was in an affair with Alan Tudge and was very honest 
about her own shortcomings and her own foibles in that situation. Um, but also was in a very, oh, I just think impossible situation there in that office and, and others, one other person has come forward since publicly others behind the scenes about that office. Um, but you know, she told her story was really supported by Australians, um, you know, immediately afterwards, then on Monday, so yesterday she was due to start a new job as a consultant uh, working with the defense industry and she hadn't signed her contract yet. She said, look, I'll sign it when I come into the office. They allowed her to come into the office and they pulled her into the you know, manager's uh, office and told her that they would have to rethink her contract given her media appearance. So anyone who is wondering about the public interest and anyone who is banging on about consensual affairs, there is what happens to women when they come forward about these sorts of issues. She lost her career in parliament and now she's still being penalised for, you know, speaking the truth. And, and because Alan Touch doesn't deny that, this went on you know it's not it's not like she's making up some sort of story it happened but it and every woman that you know i've spoken to um about this beyond a sort of a group of women who are routinely come out against other women <laughs> um have has said to me you know we're sick of this we're sick of these cultures we we have to face them um, wherever we go. And the fact that it's happening in the nation's parliament, where there are gross power imbalances between ministers of the crown and young female staffers, is just sort of beyond the pale. Like, I think women are just re really, really want change. Mm -hmm. And I really hope that what we exposed last week does result in some change even if it just means that these blokes think twice before they start pursuing the young pretty blonde staffer in the office or in another minister's office because now of course with the bonk ban they don't uh, they don't pursue their own staff they go after staff in other offices and i note the very sort of tricky answers that um <laughs> the attorney general has given about this i mean it it, it is really you know in all seriousness you know these are ministers of the crown they make decisions about how the rest of us live our lives they ought to be held to a very very high standard and you know no one as malcolm turnbull said in the story no one's forcing them to do this job it is a great privilege and with that privilege comes responsibility and, and they need to take yep. a bit more responsibility. Yeah, yep. I'm nodding, of course, because I'm thinking back. Um, a, a woman of a, a woman over sixty, I think we learned. All, I, I think back over my time in places and just realised that my behaviour was different from the young man next to me. You know, there was just different behaviours all the time. And I'm not saying I was a good person. I wasn't. I was, uh, but I was a person um, schooled in certain behaviors that now people like you and these women are saying let's be aware of those behaviors and let's change them if that's what we want um the barristers in reading witness uh, there were lots of moments that surprised me um simple things that i really ought to have been aware of um one was when you write about barristers who think it's anathema is the word you use to prepare questions to um, for the uh, for the person that they're uh, interrogating in advance, it's beneath their dignity to actually prepare it because they're the you know I think we've seen too many television shows really with the great um, the barrister destroying the witness. The portraits you paint of these powerful men, they're rich men too um, through their through their profession, and they're older men as you pointed out before for the most part. They're not very attractive portraits, and I wonder if you started out in the law 
as a humble and empathetic character. Louise, do you think you'd make it? Do you think you'd last? I'm really glad that despite the fact that I, you know, did a law degree, that I didn't pursue a career in the law. It was interesting. I was only talking last night to a mum who had a play date with uh, her daughter had a play date with my daughter, um, and she's a she's a solicitor, and she said she sat there watching my story last Monday night, and you know talking about the issues that we're talking about in witness, and she just raged, raged because she had seen this stuff go on in the law. Um, I think I come from sort of rebel Irish Catholic stock, you know, like um, I, I don't really like being told what to do. <laughs> um, I, I think I would really struggle in, in some of these environments, but there are a lot of like really amazing women barristers who are really kind of challenging this hierarchy and who are doing things differently and men as well there are really and and that's the other thing like i don't want to i don't want it, any of this to come across as some sort of black and white um you know baddies and goodies sort of situation because you know one of the interesting things that i dealt with along my journey for one of a less oprah winfrey-esque word um was um that i became um involved in my own sort of legal proceedings because I was protecting confidential sources. And if I had, basically I had to come before the court to defend my confidential sources. Um, and, and if I'd lost, um, I risked being prosecuted for contempt of court, which at worst carries a jail penalty. Now, my view was at the time that, uh, these are people who come from a community that's been profoundly betrayed by an institution and I was not going to betray them. But in that process, I was being defended by a wonderful um, silk barrister, uh, Peter Morrissey, who I have a really great relationship with. But Peter Morrissey has done a lot of these cases. Um, he has um, defended, uh, you know, Christian brothers who have become completely notorious for raping children in Ballarat. So it was an interesting process. And I interviewed Peter afterwards um, because I wanted to get a sense of this person that I really like, who has been my protector and my defender, you know, what are his sort of views on this? And we had some really quite raw conversations, including one that's at the end of the book. Um, and, you know, and he, he kept trying to defend the role of the barrister. He also did say that, you know, he doesn't take the, the bullying approach, although someone said to me, oh, you wouldn't want to be cross-examined by Peter Morrissey. So I'm not quite sure because I've never seen him cross-examine a complainant. But um, I remember sitting in his chambers and, you know, and, and I was like, mate, my cross-examination, like the only worst time that I had in my life was when I identified my first husband's body in the morgue. And he was very quiet and he just, he, he had a moment of understanding, I think. And, and I think he, he knows that I'm not, you know, some sort of crazy person who would just say something like that willy-nilly but i just needed him to know i needed him to know that you know you need to think about your behavior i'm not saying that he has done that to people because i'm not 100 percent sure but i i wanted him as a person who who spends a lot of time with a lot of the other barristers you know, who are in my book, he's on the same floor as Robert Richter. And every time I went to see him, um, I would fear bumping into Richter in a lift. I just feel sick. And in fact, he would, because he's so kind, like he would come down and he would, you know, sort of stand with me in the lift so I didn't have to be alone um, and didn't have to be confronted in that way. 
but um but you know that's every time i go to the legal district i feel this pit this this feeling of sickness in the pit of my stomach and then i immediately go to how the victims must feel if that's how i feel how do they feel how do they ever get past this how do they ever manage that bullying and that disbelief um, about something that they were so brave to do and if there are these types of barriers to people like that coming forward what happens it means that rapists and pedophiles and people who abuse the trust of little children and who treat women with disgusting disrespect get away with it like they can walk amongst us and and, and we can't do that no i think that the, what you said just then um is is the is the story of your book you we need to know and let me just um uh tell people who haven't read it the 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 way louise has structured this book is um incredibly helpful and leads us on time and time again to not be too uh, horrified or certainly not um there's no morass of detail there, but there's enough detail for us to help us. Another moment that I found very surprising, Louise, um, and I ought to have known because it's the whole point of your book, which is called Witness. It's the key point. The victim of the crime of sexual assault or rape is a witness. They do not have the support of a defence lawyer in court. In fact, they don't have much support at all. There's a lovely dog and there's some games in the room, but the lack of support um, is part of the problem of the structure of the way we do these trials. Have you come to believe um, that a crucial change is needed to the system and one of those changes will be the use of a defence lawyer in some way in the court? Absolutely, and it's a fundamental part of why I wrote this book. Um, I think Saxon Mullins, the young woman in the Lazarus case, who you know went through a shocking ordeal, um, she puts it so brilliantly. She says, you know, of, of herself being described as a witness, I didn't hover over my own body. This happened to me. And yet when these people go to court, they are so removed from the process. It's, it is a contest between the state and the accused. It's, they are not a party. I'm not saying they should be a party because that would be a fundamental overhaul of the system. But I do think that, you know, the least that we could afford them is a lawyer who's just there to make sure that their fundamental human rights and you know in victoria we have um a charter of human rights and some of the provisions in it go to how witnesses are treated so that they're not breached so that the evidence act um the improper questioning el uh, elements of the evidence act are not breached because you know some barristers will say to you well that's up to the crown prosecutor that's up to the judicial officer but the thing is, very often, it's a luck of the luck of the drawer as to who you get as a crown prosecutor or a judicial officer, and sometimes it's actually not in the interests of the crown prosecutor to intervene when there is improper questioning and bullying, which is leading the witness to cry, because then, you know, if the witness cries for for the jury, the we, the jury sees that this person is a real person who is a victim you know so not a wooden witness it's actually quite helpful and i know um there was a woman i spoke to for the book called georgie berg who was a victim of an anglican pedophile priest and she had that discussion with the crown prosecutor um she was completely distressed in her uh cross-examination and you know this was admitted to her to the point where she had nosebleeds 
she was having involuntary nosebleeds while she was giving evidence. Um, so, so yeah, it, it's not always in the interest of the Crown Prosecutor. Also, sometimes they might be playing a low-profile approach because, for example, just plucking something out of the air, you might have a high-profile defendant who is supported by a lot of politicians and media pundits who is claiming that they that this is a witch hunt and a show trial and that the prosecution is you know just running running the line of a of a, of a particular um uh, um how would i put it um uh, grudge against this high pro high profile defendant um and so in that case, the, the Crown Prosecutor might decide to be quite subtle and to let the defence go because they don't want to be seen as running a show trial and a witness uh, and, a, and a witch hunt. Then when we come to the judicial officer, they might have a defence counsel who is um, just going for it and, and, and they just don't stop bullying the witness. And there are only so many times that the judicial officer can actually intervene before potentially it becomes an appeal point because um, the, the defence argues that the, the, the judge or the magistrate had an apprehended bias. Exactly that happened in the Pell case in the committal proceeding. Um, Robert Richter argued that the magistrate, Belinda Wallington, had an apprehended bias. I mean, there was no proof of that. And in my experience, from what I saw of um, Her Honour, she behaved in a way that was absolutely beyond reproach the whole time. Um, and yeah, so it, 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 it's, it's quite difficult for sometimes for judges to intervene all the time. And, and, and it's not always in the interest of the Crown Prosecutor. So we need someone else, but not just to intervene when there's improper questioning, also to advise the witness about how they might better manage this process. Now, that's not coaching the witness to give specific answers because that goes against the criminal justice system and the principles um, that underpin it. But just for instance, to let them know as the QC who advised me, let me know, you don't have to answer yes or no when the when the defense counsel is hammering you to answer yes or no if it's not best answered by a yes or a no now i in my evidence would quite frequently turn to the magistrate and say i'm terribly sorry your honor but um this question is not best answered by a yes or a no if mr richter would like to rephrase it you know i might be able to answer it you know words to that effect that drove him absolutely bananas but the point is it, it, it's a fiction to to say that a question has to be answered by a yes or a no the other thing that often happens is witnesses don't give best evidence because they become bamboozled so for instance a um a defense counsel will say to them uh well this person came into court and they said that this happened um and they told us that you told them this mm -hmm. and they're just trying to kind of confuse the witness and the witness is sort of like if if they're not properly advised about the process like oh well if he said it in the court it must be true and they end up giving evidence against themselves mm -hmm. um knowing that it's not the truth mm -hmm. So a lawyer, again, could help them to understand that process. Mm. In Victoria, we've just had a trial of intermediaries who are people who come into court to assist people, largely children with, um, and people with learning difficulties or you know, communication issues, autism, for instance. I think that's a wonderful development as a parent of it child on the autism spectrum it absolutely horrifies me that we didn't have it before because i can't imagine how we could ever have achieved justice um and and that's great but the thing is you know if we accept that you know a child a teenager might might get that kind of assistance what magically happens when that person turns 18 that they're suddenly able to withstand this barrage of bullying questioning. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, like mm. Saxon Mullins was a teenager mm. when she was mm. cross-examined mm. in, in her case. Saxon Mullins, I, is a, it, Saxon Mullins is a great case because, of course, she has gone on and you mentioned, you talk about her later in the book, she's gone on to become an advocate and, and what a what a, an amazing strength she's drawn. And I think her sister says something about how proud they are that uh, this this young woman, this girl from becoming the girl who was the, the victim um, of, of rape and then on to somebody who um, becomes an advocate and, and has grown in strength. Louise, last question. Um, and it's a, it's a tricky one because you write about uh, talking to a woman who's a lawyer and you ask her the question um, in one of those beautiful um, scenes that you do in the book where you leave us to, to contemplate what you've said. You don't, you don't tell us what to think about this, but um, sh you ask her whether uh, you, you, she would advise people to go to the police and to go through the court process and she says no. And there's a moment when you can hear you thinking, well, that's really sad. What about you? What, if, what would you advise to, um, to someone who's the victim of sexual assault would you advise them to go through the court procedure? I still want to have faith in the system. I still want perpetrators to be brought to account. I have advised people to go through the system. I encouraged a complainant against a very high profile, well resourced defendant to come to go before the system to, to make his complaint to police it was a terribly bruising experience for him and parts of me feel guilty that he went through that because i encouraged him to do that i mean he made his own decision don't get me wrong but i said he, he, he wanted to help other men who had made complaints about this person. And I said, I think that's the right thing to do. He wishes he didn't do it now. Um, and I feel, you know, part of me feels really bad about that. But I still want to convince people to go through the system more than anything i want the system to change it's not it's not fair that they have to go through this um i can't lose faith in the justice system you know um because i just don't want these people to get away with it um but I understand that, you know, if I was to encourage someone to do that, that it would be a very bruising experience for them. And I want the people who are in charge of the system, the lawmakers, the judicial officers, the barristers, solicitors, I want them to all take pause and to take some responsibility for what they're doing to people and not to just to brush it off and not just to say oh it's um it's not a perfect system but it's the best one we've got that's not good enough we have to do better um well i think i think louise that this book has certainly um i don't think it's a, a big statement to say that this has given us a bit of a kick up the bum to, <laughs> to make the, those changes and I'm hoping that there's a few kicks up the bum in the legal system um, and they're feeling it. I th think it will certainly give a lot of people um, the, the wherewithal, the strength um, and the information that which is so important to make those changes. We'll stop now and I want to thank you very much for taking the time in a very, you, you haven't had a pause over years. You haven't had a pause. Uh, it's been a long process and I bet you had no idea five years ago that it was going to take so much of your life. I'm very grateful to you for, for witness. Um, thank you. And I hope we get a chance to speak with you in the future. Thank you, Louise. Thanks so much.